Uh, today we're going to talk about a subject that I have never written on, and uh, it's deception in the end times, how to recognize it and avoid it. And um, I think you heard a number of the speakers today say, you know, most Americans are thinking we're in the end times. They've actually done a survey about this. Um, Barna did a survey, and 77% of evangelicals think that we're in the end times right now. In fact, 45% of all Americans, not just evangelicals, not just Christians, think we're in the end times. So there is a lot of interest in end times now. And if you really think about it, what is the hallmark of the end times? What is the one thing that sets the end times apart from other times? And I think deception is, is a big part of that. Uh, but I haven't heard um, a talk on deception in the end times before, so I thought it would be uh, interesting for us to do that, and uh, so we're going to begin. Uh, uh, you may see a few uh, pictures of Guatemala in the, uh, in the uh, presentation today. Uh, I'm very proud of those pictures. They were taken by my 15-year-old daughter when we were on mission today, uh, this summer. We were, a big part of the summer, we were on mission in Guatemala. And we have a couple pictures on that. And um, she, uh, I think she has received her call uh, from the Lord already at 15. Um, so we're very excited about her and about what she's doing. So, you know, proud Papa, just like Joel was talking about his kids. Well, uh, she's, uh, she actually was adopted from Guatemala. And, you know, we're talking about maybe going back. So um, very exciting stuff for our, our family. So. Deception in the end times. I don't think anybody in this room is a stranger to deception, right? I mean, you know, lying. And, you know, if we're going to um, talk about it, you know, is it this thing? I mean, we are totally bombarded with fake news. I mean, right-wing media, left-wing media, social media, uh, it, it, you know, you can't escape it. I've got to the point where I don't know what's real anymore. Uh, you know, I, 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 in terms of trusting a news source, I mean, can we really? Um, you know, but is that the type of deception we talked about? Or is it this, takia? Now this is a, a very unusual word. You can probably see it's not an English word, uh, takia. And it, that is the very unusual, uh, peculiar Muslim practice of encouraging lying to further the cause of Allah. Uh, have, have people heard of Takiya before? Well, it, it, it's not well known, but it's actually, you know, you know, the Lord hates lying lips. But in Islam, they're actually encouraged to lie to outsiders, not to their own um, fellow believers, but to outsiders to further the cause of Allah. So is deception in the end times to Kia. And then of course we have um, you know political correctness. Is um, deception in the end times political correctness? And uh, again, how can you, you've got we've reached a point in this country where I don't think we can say anything where if we don't offend somebody. <laughs> I mean, it, it really has gotten to that point. And, you know, so you can't speak the truth because you're going to offend somebody. And although it's not illegal at this point to speak and offend somebody, it's coming. And, you know, the gospel is an offense, right? The gospel is an offense. You know, if I'm going to present the gospel, I'm going to have, we're going to have to talk about sin. We're going to have to talk about that person being a sinner. Well, you know, you can't say that. It hurts my feelings. You know, is the gospel going to become illegal to present the gospel in the United States? And I, that's something we need to think about. I personally think yes, and I personally thought it was going to come a lot sooner. Uh, the election in November may have slowed things down a little bit, but... You know, are we going to see it? So are these the things that we call deception in the end times? And I would say it's all part of that. I'd say it's all like, you know, 
some of some of that, but I wouldn't say it is what Jesus had in mind as the main deception in the end times. Most of these things we just looked at are political in nature. And um, so anyway, most of those things are political in nature. And um, you know, if you look at Jesus and his ministry, you know, there were Romans that were, you know, just horrible to the people in Israel. But Jesus wasn't focusing on how to overcome Rome by political means. He was interested in overcoming Rome by spiritual means. So I think when we're talking about deception in the end times, I think we as our, should focus on things that are more spiritual. But let's look at what we worry about. And if you're like 99% of us, which includes me, Aren't these the things that we worry about? Politics. Do we worry about politics in America? Yeah. You know. Do we worry about wars, potential wars? Do we worry about terrorism? Yeah. You know. Economic failure. Does, is this something that concerns you? Is this something that you're thinking about? Religious liberty. Losing religious liberty. Do we think about that? And I certainly do. And Israel, you know, we were just heard a wonderful, um, you know, presentation by Pastor about the future of the Temple Mount, and the, the, you know, Jesus is going to have his throne there, uh, you know. But you know, a lot of us worry about Israel. Is Israel going to be conquered? So these are things that most of us, myself included, think about. But this is what Jesus had to say about these things. Uh, when you see these things, do not be terrified. These are the things that must take place. So uh, these things are not taking Jesus by surprise. But, you know, is there going to be a United States of America? Uh, not in its current form. You know, when Jesus comes back, it'll be different. But, you know, we, we may not make it that long. Uh, is there going to be war? Is there going to be terrorism? Absolutely. Is there going to be economic failure? Jesus told us there's going to be economic failure. You know, is Israel going to be conquered? Is there, uh, yes, it's going to be invaded. And the, and the Jews are going to be taken into uh, captivity in, into all the nations. These are not things that we should really have at the top of our worry list because Jesus said they're going to happen. This isn't maybe. This is going to happen. And then he says, these are the things that must take place. He's, to me, when he says that, I'm thinking, Nelson, don't worry about this. I got a plan. <laughs> and I'm coming back. But before I can come back, these are the things that have to happen. These are the things that must take place. That actually is a phrase from the book of Daniel. Uh, it is the, on the statue, Nebuchadnezzar's statue, it is the very first verse before the statue uh, where Daniel talks about, uh, you know, and defines what the, you know, the dream is that Nebuchadnezzar had. And it's the very last um, verse, the things that must take place. So when Jesus said this, he's saying, you know that Daniel statue? <laughs> Who do you think told it? You know, when Nebuchadnezzar's statue, who, who told Daniel <laughs> to interpret that dream? Well, I did. <laughs> and these are the things that must take place. So what should we worry about? You know, in my opinion, Satan's purpose is to eventually cause the world to worship Antichrist. And um, to certainly worship him before there is an Antichrist on this scene. And... Uh, preparing the church to meet those type of deceptions. So those are the things that um, I think we should be worried about. Now let's talk about, do a little housekeeping right here. This is a mixed uh, group in this room today. Okay? Um, what kind of mixed group am I talking about? <laughs> well, we all believe different things about the return of Jesus. Some believe in this room, believe that Jesus will come back before the seven year tribulation period. 
some people believe that Jesus is going to come toward the middle, the end of the end of the period, but not at the very end. Some believe at the very end. Uh, the church is wildly divided on this issue. But I think these deceptions that we're going to talk about, most of them, most of them, the church is going to see in some form. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So whatever your persuasion is on the rapture and whether you're, the church is actually going to face Antichrist or not, don't get excited because we're still going to see a lot of these different things come to pass, whatever your persuasion, whatever Jesus' choice is, because Jesus is obviously the one that knows when he is coming back. And um, I just want to do that little bit of housekeeping. So if you see a word like Antichrist and you say, well, I don't believe the church will see him, you're still going, there's still going to be ramifications up to that point. So uh, another piece of um, housekeeping that I'd like to take care of is, so what is our purpose in these end times if we're truly in them? Um, and, and I think there's a trap that uh, a lot of us can fall into, especially guys like me who write and talk about end times. And I would assume, since you're here at a conference that has this type of a theme, you're interested in the end times. And that trap is that somehow the end times are different from the first 2,000 years of Christianity. And that somehow the end times are about knowledge as opposed to being about expressing the love of Jesus. And I think that is a big trap. You know, we, we all get caught up on, you know, who's the Antichrist going to be? Where, where's he going to come from? You know, when is the rapture going to happen? You know, the Gog, Magog war, you know, where is that? And when's that going to take place? Those are important things. And Jesus and, uh, spoke on a lot of those topics because he wants us to know about them. But knowing isn't what the end times are about. Uh, I don't care what anyone's persuasion on the rapture is. Because if you live out this verse that is up on the board, uh, James 1.27, um, you know, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep yourself unpolluted from the world. That's the rest of it that's not up there. If, if you live that verse out, express the love of Jesus, testify about Jesus and the Word of God, and uh, keep yourself undefiled from the, the filth that's in the world, you will overcome in the end times whatever your persuasion on the rapture is, whether it's a Roman Antichrist or a Middle East Antichrist or a American Antichrist, it, if we can get to that, we're going to overcome. And I think that's a very important trap not to fall into. In my opinion, the end times is what it's always been about, which is expressing the love of Jesus and doing that by testifying about him to those who don't know him. So we'll get, we've got our housekeeping out of the way. So. We talked about a lot of things that we see in the world, but now let's go to what does the Bible say? You know, what does the Bible say about deception? And somewhere between 24 and 36 hours before Jesus was um, betrayed, the disciples took him aside and said, tell us about end times. And they actually said, <laughs> tell us when these things will happen. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? But they basically were saying, tell us about end times. And the very first words out of Jesus' mouth were, you know, the rapture is going to happen. Boom. No, that's not what he said. He said, see to it that no one misleads you. So Jesus didn't quickly tell them the signs about his coming. He said, see to it that no one misleads you. Well, why did he say that? Because people are going to try to mislead us. And these were his disciples he was talking to. It wasn't, you know, uh, people who were not, you know, they were, whether they were Christians at that time or not is a very debatable, you know, Peter 
Peter had admitted that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God, so that was a profession of faith. We won't get into all that, whether they were actually Christians or not. But, I mean, these were guys who were um, his followers. And uh, he was saying, you know, see to it that no one misleads you. So, when we think about the word mislead, you know, what do you think about? Lie, you know, try to fool you to do something. It, and I promise you, this will be the only Greek word we're going to look at today. But we're actually going to look at the Greek word because I think it's very important that we understand what Jesus was talking about. It's a different kind of mislead. The word is planao, and that word means um, to lead astray or to go astray. It does not mean mislead in the, in the, the way that you might think. It is um, always involved in the sin of wandering. And it has, um, it's the same word in the um, Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, Old Testament that said, uh, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So the deception in the end times is all about trying to get the sheep to be led astray. It's, it's to cause us to, to sin and sin in a way to, to leave God's path that he has for us. So what kind of deceptions did Jesus discuss? Uh, right after he said that, Jesus mentioned seven points of spiritual deception. And we're going to go over those. That's what our talk is going to be about today. And I call them the pattern of seven events. And uh, if you want to read about that, um, pattern of seven events. I wrote about it in that book, Revelation Deciphered. Um, what I uncovered in that book is that if you look at the biblical prophets, if you look at the Gospels, and you look at the book of Revelation, there were seven main events that all of those things, or most, not maybe not all, but most of the prophecies in the prophets, the Gospels, and the um, Book of Revelation can be grouped into these seven events. And um, if you want to, we're going to talk about it today, but if you want to learn more, it's in the uh, book that's there. So uh, these are the seven signs of Jesus' coming in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. We call that the Olivet Discourse. And the six seals of Revelation, I wouldn't try to copy those down right now because we're going to see them and much larger than what we got right there. But this is, so when the disciples said, what is the sign of your coming? Jesus gave, actually gave seven signs. So, um, as we were saying, this is true whatever your rapture flavor is. All right? Um, you know, a lot of these things are happening now. Granted, at the very end, sign number uh, six is not if, if there's a pre-tribulation rapture, sign number six is probably not going to be seen. But all the others are being seen in little ways now and bigger ways later. So this is not something that is um, not a, applicable to everybody uh, regardless of your rapture flavor. So uh, deception one is lying signs and lying words. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, many will come in my name, being Jesus' name, saying, I am the Christ, and will me mislead many. False Christs and false prophets, they're going to have great signs and wonders, as if to mislead, there's that word again, and it's the same lead astray, even the elect. I mean, you know, that's us. In Revelation 13, talking specifically about the false prophet, Jesus said he had two horns like a lamb. Well, who's the lamb? Like Jesus. So he's going to look like Jesus. But he spoke like a dragon. And who's the dragon? Satan. And there it is again. He uh, and his purpose is to cause the world to worship the beast. And he showed great signs. In Daniel, it said uh, that by smooth words... The little horn or the Antichrist will turn many to godlessness. 
So the first deception is there, um, let's move on. There are going to be a multitude. Jesus said there will be many of them. False prophets and false Christs. The Jews are looking for a um, Messiah Ben Joseph and a Messiah uh, Ben David. Um, the Muslims are looking for a Mahdi and they're expecting the actual, who they think will be this, the uh, historic Jesus. They call him Isa, which is basically sounds like Esau, by the way, which I find very interesting. Um, but um, they're, they're waiting for that. And, and if you look across cultures, lots of people are looking for a Messiah to come. So there are going to be a lot of them. Only one of them is the true Antichrist. Uh, they will claim to be the Messiah. They may even claim to be Jesus himself. Um, they will perform great signs. Jesus said, um, you know, it, it says it right there, they're going to be create, uh, perform signs and wonders so great that it might mislead even the elect if that was possible. So, I mean, these things are going to look like the real thing. One of the things we know is eventually the uh, false prophet is going to cause the beast to rise from the dead. Um, in Thessalonians, Paul says God sends to them a great delusion to those who don't love the truth. And the whole purpose is to, to deceive the world to worship the beast. Now, can we worship the beast today? Well. The beast isn't really on the earth yet, but in many ways I think we do when we worship anything that isn't God. It's really a, although it will be a very specific person, possibly a very specific empire, and possibly a demon, the beast may have different aspects to it, and that, that isn't here right now, but um, you know, the spirit of Antichrist is in the world right now. So Jesus has a prescription. He says, uh, when you see these things, do not believe them. Because as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Jesus is saying, guys, when you see somebody and he sounds like the real thing and he looks like the real thing, it ain't me. Because this is the way I'm coming back. I'm coming back on the clouds. I'm coming back with my Shekinah glory. The whole world is going to see Jesus, and there's not going to be any doubt. So, you know, he says, you know, if you hear they're over here or over there, don't believe it, because it, is, it isn't me. And there's that verse we just talked about. Okay, deception two is fear. Luke 21 says, when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. Revelation 6 talks about a red horse rider. And um, he's going to take peace from the earth, and that might be peace of mind. Uh, it's irene, and that, that word can also, <coughs> Greek word, oh, I said I, not the Greek word. Oh, I'm sorry, I promised only one. <laughs> sorry about that. But anyway, it, the word can also mean peace of mind. Uh, and uh, he's going to cause men to slay one another, and he's going to be given a great sword. Revelation 13 says they worship the beast because they said, who is able to wage war with the beast? So uh, fear is going to lead people to, to worship the beast. There'll be wars, revolutions, anarchy, fighting in the streets. That word disturbance in Luke actually is talking about those kind of things. That it's not just, you know, you hear wars and rumors of war. Uh, that is a very famous phrase. It comes out of Matthew. But in Luke, it's wars and disturbances. Uh, so might this be terrorism? Hmm. Might it be possible that the Antichrist could call on all the Muslims of the world, all 1.3 billion Muslims, to rise up at one time in jihad? I don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't say that, but it says things are going to be so bad that Jesus says, don't be terrified because 
the natural human response is going to be terrified. So are nuclear weapons a possibility? The red horse rider is going to be given a, a great sword. Could that be nuclear weapons? Maybe. Uh, and the purpose is to deceive the world, to worship the beast through fear. Jesus' prescription, see to it that you are not frightened, for these things must take place first. So, deception three. So, things just keep piling up, one on top of another. You know, first you have great signs, then you have fear, then you have want. Jesus said, in many places there will be famines. Um, in Revelation 6, a very interesting passage is parallel to this one. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts for a barley, for a barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil or the wine. We'll talk about that in a second. And in Revelation 13, no one is able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. All of these are economic. All of these are famine and economic based. So there will be famines. Jesus said so. Uh, in response, there's going to be price fixing. That was the, you know, a quart of wheat for a denarius. A denarius is a, um, a day's wages back in those days. So a quart of wheat looks about the size of a loaf of bread for a denarius. So a day's wages now might be about $120. I, I'm guessing that's like average wage in America or something like that. Uh, so a loaf of bread might be $120. So that's price fixing. And in response, eventually, the false prophet is going to introduce the mark of the beast. And the deception there is to make people think they only have two choices, starvation or worship the Antichrist by taking the mark. That's the deception there to think that your um, economic well-being depends on the world system. Jesus has a prescription. He says, who is the faithful and sensible slave who his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whose master finds him so doing when he comes. So Jesus' plan is that you and I are going to feed the world. How does that make you feel? A little inadequate, right? Uh, I have a, um, uh, yeah, I'm a prepper. I have uh, food put away for this very reason. But I don't think I can feed my church by myself. But I don't think we have to do it by ourselves. And if you read this book, oh, my book's not up there anymore, but if you read uh, Revelation Deciphered or my new book, um, I have quite a lot to say about this issue. I'm not prepping for my household, for my daughters or my wife. Um, uh, I'm prepping for God's household because God said that I put in charge of his, you know, who's this sensible slave that his master put in charge of his household? So who's his household? It's our churches, our small groups, possibly the, uh, uh, the apostate uh, Jewish population who are um, running, running from um, the persecution that's going to take place. So. And, uh, you know, Jesus is the great multiplier. And I think this is the part that everybody forgets, that he did it before and I could be wrong, but I think he's going to do it again. Mm. And maybe on a much wider scale. So, this fourth deception is authority. And um, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, there will be great tribulation. So, eventually, the uh, authority will be given to uh, the Antichrist over a quarter of the earth to kill. And an image of the beast is going to be set up 
and they're going to cause as many who don't worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's going to be pretty difficult times. So um, God will grant, eventually grant Antichrist authority for uh, 1,260 days to kill those who don't worship him. The great sign at the beginning of that is the abomination of desolation. And the purpose is to deceive the world that the Antichrist actually has authority over life. Now, so you say, well, I'm pre-trib. What's that have to do with me? A lot. A lot. Because what is going on right now in the Middle East? I mean, you know, we don't see the pictures as much anymore about them, you know, hauling Christians down to a beach and slitting their throats and cutting off their heads and all that crazy thing. But it's happening now. It's happening right now. We have security here today because it's happening right now. You know, we're trying to protect ourselves and praise the Lord those guys haven't been too busy I told them when I saw them out there I said I'm really glad you haven't been really too busy because <laughs> if you're busy that's just not good but it's happening right now and Jesus's prescription for the time in the tribulation is exactly his prescription for right now do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, that's a hard prescription. That is not an easy prescription. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But you know, um, this is the deception of authority. And this authority is not only a life and death authority like you know with terrorism and that type of thing but it's also the authority of our government you know we really may come to a point in this country I pray that we do not we need to do it whatever we can to try to stop that but we may come to a point where we're asked to do things that are not you know uh, in line with the Word of God But there are some things against which there are there is no law. Okay, deception five, apostasy. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time many will fall away and betray one another. That's like probably one of the saddest lines in the whole Bible. And uh, most people, most people's love will grow cold. But the gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations. So it's kind of a mixed bag at that time. In Revelation 6, it talks about martyrs and their souls uh, are under the altar. Uh, and they, are there. they were slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony that they maintained. And in Revelation 12, it says they overcame him, Satan, because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the word of their testimony, and that they did not love their life even when faced with death. So the Great Tribulation will be a time of decision. Overcomers will choose to testify, and it may lead to martyrdom. The love of most will grow cold. Many will deny Jesus or choose to hide and not testify. In the um, parable of the ten virgins, uh, the wise virgins and the foolish virgins are all asleep uh, before the coming of uh, the bridegroom. Uh, and unfortunately, that probably represents our churches now. And then, before the return of Jesus, a great shout goes out, the bridegroom is coming. Something is going to happen that's going to wake everybody up. And then, both the wise and the foolish get out their torches, because it says lamps in your Bible, but the actual word is, oh, I'm, another Greek word. I'll, I won't say the Greek word, but it actually means torches. <laughs> and um, 
So everybody lights their torches. Both the wise and the foolish light their torches. Well, what is that torch? It's your testimony. But the foolish run out of oil. And it's for that very reason that the foolish do not go in to the wedding feast. So um, what does that say? Is hiding from bad times really what Jesus wants for us? Or does he want us to uh, not hide our light under a basket, but put it, put it out where everybody can see? So it's something to think about. Um, many former, ch at that time, many former churchgoers are going to betray their families and friends. Just because your pre-trib does not mean this isn't going to happen to us before the tribulation also. So again, depending on your flavor of rapture timing, this does not mean this will not happen in this country. You know, there is um, there's a lot of movement in this country to conform to some of that political correctness and the other things we looked at at the beginning. It won't be as intense as it will later. All these things are building, but it doesn't mean we're not going to see this. It, it doesn't mean we will, but it doesn't mean we won't. And so the purpose is to deceive churchgoers that they can escape this by apostasy, and apostasy means denying Jesus, but he has a prescription for that as well. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father. Uh, but whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father. That's very scary. Uh, and the ten virgins, he said, uh, away from me, you evildoers, I, I, I do not, I never knew you. That's not the words I want to hear from my Master. Um, so he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. So, deception six. This is one, if you're pre-tribulation and that turns out to be correct, um, this will not be seen. But the sixth deception is an interesting one. Luke says there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, and on the earth dismay among the nations. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Revelation 6 says the sun became black, the moon became like blood, and the stars uh, fell from the sky, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains and said, hide us from the face, the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. And Isaiah talks about the same things. Uh, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will flash forth their light, and the sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. So the sun and the moon are going to get dark uh, and on earth there will be earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, Luke talks about that. The unrepentant are going to hide in caves and the repentant will lift their eyes looking for the return of Jesus. And the purpose, this is different than everything else we looked at. Everything else was like Satan's purpose to try to get people to not worship God, but this is actually a separation. This, this event is God's doing. God is going to separate the unrepentant from the repentant at that point. And unknowing, and I use the word Christians here, again, if you are uh, pre-trib, this would be tribulation saints, may not realize this is a God thing. But this is a time when Jesus wants us to lift our heads and to look, because he's coming. And that um, picture there is Lake uh, Attilan, in, uh, it's beautiful, there are volcanoes all around it. And I was looking at those and I was thinking, wow, they're going to be cast in the heart of that sea. Into the, you, know, you can just imagine all those mountains being cast into the heart of a sea. So those are the six um, deceptions uh, that Jesus talked about. And they're not the ones that we normally think about. Which brings us to deception number seven. And you say, whoa, rapture timing. You said you weren't going to talk about this, and this is all good. 
I want you to think about something. One third of the church believes that we will face the Antichrist. One third believes we will not face the Antichrist. One third has no clue. <laughs> that is totally unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable because our Bibles should be able to tell us whether we're going to or not. So let's look at it this way. Let's say pre-tribulation rapture theory is correct and the church doesn't face the Antichrist. There shouldn't be anyone preaching at all that we are going to face the Antichrist because you're going to scare people out of the pews. It is a sin. Let's say pre-tribulation rapture theory is wrong and the church does face the Antichrist. It is a sin to preach that, that we're going to escape that because people aren't going to be prepared. I mean, uh, that's going to be a big deception. It's, you were talking about deception and times. It's going to be very serious and people are going to fall away. Jesus said, the love of most will grow cold. So we're trapped. We are trapped. It's sin if you do over here. It's sin if you don't over there. We need to know the answer with biblical certainty. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the church is not engaged in a dialogue. We're engaged in a Twitter war. You know what a Twitter war is? You know, you put this out, you know, uh, the church isn't seen after Revelation chapter 3. It's pre-tribulation. And then, you know, this side camp over here says, well, after the tribulation of those days, that's when Jesus comes back. So, you know, the Twitter war it doesn't accomplish anything, but it, but it, it, it's, it's just, it's so frustrating. So, I'm a simple man. I'm not, you know, a great theologian, and I'm certainly not one of the top thousand leaders of the church. But I decided to, and my ministry decided to do what we could do. We put this book together called Rapture Case Closed, and there is a question mark at the end of close, because I don't believe that I have all the answers. Um, but I did the best job we could to analyze all the rapture theory that are out there. A Walvrood and Thomas Ice and all these other guys that have written on it and look at it from my perspective. And we came up with 147 different proofs for rapture timing. Uh, of those, probably three or four dozen have never been published before by anybody. So we put them together in this book to make a case for when I think, notice just I think, not what is, but what I think is the timing of the rapture. Maybe right, maybe wrong. And then uh, my ministry sacrificially has given and we are printing a thousand copies and mailing them to the thousand top leaders of the Christian church in America. And that is going to take place in, within one month. And it's going to be all the denominations, all the leaders of the denominations, the, all the main teachers at the um, seminaries and Bible colleges, uh, 450 top pastors in America, uh, all the media people that you know, you're all familiar with in Christian media. So we're going to send it out there. And the whole idea is to create a dialogue. Not to say, this is what it is, but to create a dialogue so that the leaders of the church and the whole church comes together prayerfully, and you can pray about this, to decide the issue so that we don't have to feel trapped not being sure of what the return of our king will be like. Because I can't imagine Jesus would return without letting us know for sure when that's going to be. Not like September or something or whatever, but you know, not a date setting, but a basic idea, are we going to face the Antichrist? I cannot imagine he would not allow that to happen. And if we're that divided, one-third, 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 we don't know. We really don't know. And it's a scary place to be. So, Jesus said, see that no one misleads you. We have about five minutes for questions. If anyone has a question, I'd be happy to take it now. Can you get this video that we ordered? Uh, the, uh, 
the what's being taped today? Yes. Uh, I believe it can be, right? I'm not sure. Who's I think it's going to go actually go on YouTube, and it may be free. Can you get it on YouTube? It will be available. That's what I'm told. Okay. That's that's why we're taping it today. Yeah. Oh, there must be some questions. <laughs> Yes. What was the hardest uh, issue for you in facing people that were not, not pre-trained? In other words, what's the, what's the most difficult issue for you? Um, when people bring that before you, know, like, so I'm not a pre-trained, but what is the one that makes people the most trouble? Um, Scripture-wise, or is there one? Well, I suggest you get the book. Um, there's 147 separate proofs in that book. Um, and we look at all of them. Uh, I don't really feel that there, there's a great deal of difficulty there, but you, you, you have to look at it and read it for yourself and then you can decide what it is. I, I, I don't really feel there's one that's difficult, but we'll probably not talk about that in this setting. So if you say, you know, tell me some proofs or whatever, I, I, I will. I'll give you questions. I'll, I'll put out some questions right now, and then you can think about these questions, okay? In the Olivet Discourse, which is the what we were talking about today, uh, where Jesus talks on the Mount of Olives to his disciples about what the signs of his coming are. Um, most theologians believe that those six signs of Jesus' coming in the Olivet Discourse are exactly the same as the first six seals of Revelation. Uh, Ice believes that, Walrood, uh, a lot of the post-trib guys believe that. It's, it's pretty universal that that's accepted. But yet, the Olivet Discourse does not include the trumpet and bold judgments. Okay? Why? Why? They're in Revelation. Why aren't they, when, you know, the disciples said, what's the sign of your coming? Jesus gave Six signs, why aren't the trumpet and bowls in the Olivet Discourse? You can think about that. Um, you noticed when we were reading after the sixth seal that the whole world is going to see Jesus' face. They're going to see his face. What is that? What is that? You know, why is Jesus seen there in the middle of the book of Revelation? You know, it, it, it's not him coming on the white horse. What, what is that? So that's something else to think about. So those are, those are a couple. The another one, you know, that Jesus is going and his angels are going to judge the world with fire. Um, there are literally a dozen um, verses in the Bible that talks about how he's going to judge the world with fire. But yet, when you look at Jesus coming in at Armageddon, there's no fire. So when is that fire fall, and how does Jesus judge the world with fire? So these are things that you can think about, and they're answered in the book. So, uh, you yes, you're Gretchen. Involved in a ministry in Guatemala. Um, I was there on mission. Uh -huh. I was working with um, uh, Manos de Jesus, which is uh, Hands of Jesus, and we were. Um, I had my uh, family with me. It was real awesome. My daughters were uh, born in Guatemala, and we. I have one biologic daughter, my wife and I, and then we have two adopted daughters, and they were with us, and um, we were building homes at 10,000 feet for widows and orphans, and um, presenting the gospel, feeding people, uh, a lot of kids there, it just breaks your heart, um, you know, what's going on there. Um, and there's, they have a very unique uh, form of Catholicism in uh, Guatemala, it's called Santorini. And it's sort of a mix between Catholicism and the ancient Mayan religion. And uh, they do sacrifices to other gods and stuff. It's, it's pretty despicable. And we, we saw Mayan sacrifices taking place while we were there. Uh, you saw that one big jaguar temple. When we were there, they were actually, there was an old ancient altar there. And they were doing sacrifices right there while we were there. It was very dark and, oh, it stunk. They were burning stuff. Oh, it was terrible. Animal sacrifices? It's not legal for them to do animal sacrifices, but whether there was animal blood mixed in with the, I don't, I don't even want to know. Are any of your books available on uh, Kindle? On Kindle? Kindle. 
Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, my first two books, um, Revelation Deciphered and Are We Ready for Jesus, are um, both available on Kindle. The new book will be available on Kindle after it's been received by the uh, uh, 1,000 leaders. In the back and then right here. Thank you, Leonard. Um, I'm thankful for the, the measured, dispassionate way that, that you're conveying this. You know, on the one hand, some people who do the rant and rave approach and can have a, an initial effect, but, but <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful that you have this, it, it's passionate, but it's, it, it appeals to my senses and my reason. A thing that makes me trust this as well, but it's a single punctuation mark, and that's the question mark. Yeah. And aren't we all, aren't we all just brothers and sisters and, you know, of one Lord and Savior? And, uh, of course, we, we all should judge everything we do with humility because only Jesus is truth. And the closer we get to him, the closer we are to truth. I was listening to a talk show last week, and unfortunately I couldn't tell you who made the statement or even what the program I was when I listened to a Christian talk. But the author said um, there was nothing else that needed to, that even had to be done for Jesus to return again. Could you address your thoughts? That theory is called imminence. Okay. And um, uh, I address it in the book, okay. what my thoughts are on it. Okay. Uh, the theory is not that nothing will happen, mm -hmm. but nothing has to happen. Okay? There's a huge difference. Yeah. There is a huge difference between nothing will happen, which would be a pretty dangerous statement for somebody to make, and nothing has to happen. So um, I'm not saying I support the theory of imminence because there are actually many pre-tribulation rapture theory believers who do not support the theory of imminence, but for those who do, the theory is that nothing has to happen, but that uh, things can happen, and certainly Look at the state of Israel, right? I mean, the state of Israel is now, uh, you know, uh, was not for, you know, 1900 years and now is. So, you know, that was an enormous miracle and certainly a sign that we're getting close to Jesus coming back.